Hello, my name's Jan. I'm a trained hypnotherapist. I have diplomas in psychology and cognitive behavioural therapy and I also work with children. Now, when all this coronavirus thing kicked off, I very soon started to wonder how children were feeling based on how us as adults feel, how confusing it is, how we don't quite get all the information or we don't understand the information we're given. And children are around adults a lot at this time and are exposed to language that they don't perhaps understand. They might hear the news, um, they might hear parents or loved ones talking about things. So what I did is I sat down and I wrote a story um, that I'm going to read today. I have to say that I haven't memorised it, so I am going to read from script. Um, and it may be recognisable to some of you, because uh, it is a bit of a fairy tale, but as we know, all fairy tales are kind of based on one, really, with a little bit of a twist on them. So they are, it kind of is all my ideas, but it may be familiar. Now, when I'm in class, we do something called mindfulness, and it's a bit of a buzzword in education, and it's a very good way of, of helping, helping children to relax. Um, it makes them aware of their feelings and their uh, bodily sensations, their surrounding environment, what's going on around them. Um, so I always use my trusty um, singing bowl, so it's a Buddhist singing bowl. Um, and what I do is on my first lesson I will bang it so it's got this sound and when they can't hear that anymore and by the way they've got their eyes shut they have to put their hands up um, so it very much becomes competitive with children they try and be the last one to put their hands up but what I want to do with you today just to uh, get you a little bit relaxed before I tell my tale is do a little bit of this um, but what I will do is I'm, I'm going to bang the bowl and when you can't hear the sound anymore, I want you to concentrate on one sound. Now our brains really struggle sometimes to concentrate on one sound. So I want you to hone in on one and just go away with it until you hear me ring the bowl again and then I shall start to tell you my story. So I'm really lucky, I'm in the garden, so if you listen, I've got the sound of birds all around me, so I don't mind if you borrow my birds, if you wanna hone in and try and listen to them as well. So get nice and comfortable. If you're not comfortable, find somewhere, pause me, and then come back to me once uh, you've found somewhere. So you can, lay, you can lay down on your bed, you can lay on the sofa, you can sit on a chair, you can get on the carpet, or just sit on wherever you are now. So let's get ready. So we're gonna shut our eyes and I'm gonna bang the bowl and you're gonna to listen to the sound for as long as you can hear it and then concentrate on a sound and then come back to me, so. So even though you thought I might listen to the birds, I could actually hear my wind chime. So if you see over there, I've got a bamboo wind chime and that was just very lightly clanging. Uh, so I found myself drifting towards that. Okay, so um, I just will say, feel free to share this with anyone who you think might need it. Anyone who's struggling with anxiety at the moment, and not just for children, it might be that you've got an adult you can pass it on to. Feel free to make it public on Facebook or on YouTube, on Instagram, wherever you share, wherever you uh, have social media, or just share it with your, your loved ones at home. So I hope you enjoy it, and please feel free to give me any feedback. Once upon a time, there was a revolting, invisible wolf, and he was called Mr. Coriona. Even though he was invisible, everyone was scared and felt intimidated by him. He would creep up on people when they least expected it and touch them with his nastiness. Because he was such a nuisance, the queen of the land ordered everyone to stay in their houses to avoid him. They were only allowed to go out for a short period every day and they were told they couldn't even visit their own families and this made the world a very sad place. The children of the land were not able to go to school, meaning they could not see their friends and some parents had to stay home from work. Being at home meant that children had to learn in a new way and in some houses learning became more electronic with many lessons accessed online using parents' phones, iPads, computers and the parents became the teacher. 
but they loved that because it meant that they had more time with their children, creating some wonderful memories. Learning at home was fun, but the children missed their teachers and they missed their school. They started to miss the smallest things, like the smell of cabbage that lingered after lunch in the dinner hall, the noise at playtime, and sitting giggling with their friends over the smallest and silliest things. When they did go out for walks, they made sure that they made every moment count. The roads were quieter, and they noticed how loud the birds chirped in the trees, something they hadn't noticed before. They noticed how green the trees were, and even though they could not play in the playgrounds, they appreciated the times that they could swing high on the swings, that they could whiz down the roundabout and down the slide. And people suddenly realised that the things that they missed, they'd taken for granted. But some struggled, and many really couldn't understand why they were unable to go back to a normal way of living. It wasn't just the children that felt this way, adults did too. But they tried to stay strong for the children. They continued to smile and often pretended that they were okay. But really, they were scared and they missed things too. How could people stay safe? They had no hero to turn to and the army were away working in another kingdom. The doctors and nurses were overwhelmed with what Mr Coriona was doing. But they soldiered on and the people of the land appreciated that them by applauding them every Thursday, by banging their saucers, by shouting outside their front doors and they started to raise funds to help them in their efforts. One day, while sitting and thinking about her country's troubles on her golden throne, the Queen decided that enough was enough and summoned the Prime Minister to discuss the ongoing problems with the vicious beast. After a long conversation, with many ideas being discussed on how they could capture and imprison the wolf, they came up with what they thought was an excellent plan. She summoned her special messengers and told them that they were to knock on every door of the kingdom to search for a special child to help. How will we know who is the chosen one? They inquired. Ah, the Queen answered. This we have thought about very carefully. And she went on to share the details with the intrigued messengers. As they stood there in their red uniforms with medals of bravery and valour glistening on their chests in the sunshine, she told them that they would be searching for a child that could answer three questions from her favourite film. Uh, and if you don't mind me being nosy, what is your favourite film, ma'am? asked a curious bearded man. Pleased that the question had been asked, she replied with some enthusiasm. Oh, that wonderful Disney film by Ariel, you know, The Little Mermaid. Only very special people will know the answers to questions about that film. Oh, simply splendid, the Prime Minister uttered in his deep and authoritative voice. Becoming serious, the Queen whispered, Let me share with you, my faithful messengers, the questions you are to ask. There was a hush in the room and everyone looked in anticipation towards the Queen and she spoke quietly and confidently. The questions are very important and difficult questions. They are, the Prime Minister smiled knowingly and the messengers almost stopped breathing, such was their nervousness. They are, what colour is Sebastian? Who is Ursula? And Flounder is blue and... Oh, the Prime Minister did a little jiggy, clapped his hands and declared that the questions were simply fantabulous. And the messengers looked at each other, then at the Prime Minister, then finally at the Queen, and together they erupted in applause. The Queen continued to explain that when they had found the child, he or she should travel to her favourite place in London by golden carriage to meet with her and enjoy juice and a mountain of cakes to discuss Mr Coriona. Tomorrow, she explained, you will have to travel to the furthest corners of my beautiful kingdom to knock on everyone's door and ask them the questions, but, hmm, but, ensure that all three questions are answered correctly. Suddenly, there seemed to be a hope and a build-up of excitement flowing through everyone in the room. You all need to get an early night, for tomorrow your task will start, and I feel sure that this special child will be discovered and able to then help in my quest, the Queen concluded and with her right hand, she shooed them out of the room. The next day, the search started. At first, they were very enthusiastic and greeted everyone with a smile. But soon they became frustrated and weary. And as the days went on, they began to think that there was no one that could answer all three of the Queen's special questions. They searched high, they searched low, and they knocked on so many doors. 
but not one person could answer all three questions. Ha! They knew that Ursula was a sea witch, well we all know that one, or that Flounder was blue and of course yellow, but the question about Sebastian just couldn't be answered. They had one more hamlet to search and that was the hamlet of Essex. But Hope was quickly drifting away. How would Her Majesty react if they failed in their task? Would it be off with their heads or even worse, Brussels sprouts on toast for a whole year? As they arrived in Essex, there was a bright sun in the sky. The birds were singing sweetly on the branches of the trees and this made them suddenly feel positive. Over the past week, they had knocked on three million doors, pressed countless doorbells and this was their last chance. Towards the end of the day, they reached their final road, Hopeland Avenue. They knocked on every door, but no one could answer. Ha! Well, that's it, said the messenger. We have to tell Her Majesty that we have failed. Hello, came a voice. Uh, who? Uh, uh, where? What? The messenger asked suspiciously. Up here, look up to the highest window, it's me. As they craned their necks to look up, they could see a small curly-haired girl waving madly at them. Hey, haven't we seen you? They said. Well, no, you haven't. Well, have you got something important to say? Well, no one ever says anything I've got to say is important, she says. Hmm, we'll see about that, the Queen's messenger said sternly and proceeded to knock loudly on the blue painted door. Oh, it's you again, a rather brash woman shouted. Come to give me another chance, have you? Oh, no, madam. We would like to talk to you about the child who's in the room at the top of your house. Um, could we speak with her? Seriously? She's got nothing to say that you'll find interesting. She does me head in, she does. Plainly does me head in. The messenger went on. Well, as a representative of Her Majesty the Queen, I think I will be the judge of that. And he stared with authority at the detestable woman. She proceeded to shout up the stairs to the child, who quickly came running with glee towards the door. How nice to meet you, young lady. My name is Stefano. May I ask yours? My name's Daisy, replied the child, smiling at the kind face of the stranger. The messenger then went on to explain that he had three very important questions to ask and told her that she should think carefully before answering and take her time. The child readily agreed to answering the questions and reassured the man that she would try her very hardest because she always did. Okay, here is number one. Who is Ursula? Ha! She's a sea witch, the child announced confidently. The messengers smiled at each other. <laughs> now for number two. Flounder is blue and yellow, she shouted again. The messengers looked at each other and were thankful that she had at least answered the two questions that everyone else could answer, because they did feel a little bit sorry for her. And now the final question, Daisy. Now this is a question that no one in the world, not in the whole of our kingdom, has been able to answer. Oh! Oh, I love the Little Mermaid. I've seen it so many times, the child announced. Please ask me. And she listened really carefully to their words. What colour is Sebastian? Ah well, that's the easiest question of all, she said. He's a red crab and he serves King Triton. The King's, Queen's messengers looked at each other and then at the young girl and then at each other again. Wow! They exclaimed. She's the chosen one. She is special. With that, the two messengers and Daisy all started to dance around chanting, We're now, we're now, we're now. They spoke with her mother, who by this time was embarrassed but shouting loudly to the neighbours that she always knew that her child was destined for greatness. The mother readily agreed that she could, she could go to London to meet the Queen in her palace. So off they all set in the imperial carriage. Curtains started to twitch and faces were pressed against windows along the roads as news leaked out that Daisy had been chosen to meet with Her Majesty the Queen in London in her favourite palace. It was such a spectacle, a golden carriage, six white horses and a small curly haired girl waving at everyone proudly. They were soon in London and the child was astounded when they rounded a corner and a a famous diamond butterfly was flying high above the palace. 
It was flapping sedately in the summer breeze and that meant that the Queen was at home. This flag was her special flag. It meant that greatness was going to be there. As she walked into the palace, she was astonished at the beautiful golden statues standing spectacularly in the long hallway. As she walked, she could feel the deep pile of the red carpet beneath her feet. And as she looked up, she stared in wonder at the sparkling chandeliers hanging majestically from the ceiling. And they were everywhere. The pictures on the walls were of kings and queens and she recognised them from her history lessons. Oh, there was King Simon, you know, the one that married nine times and thought nothing of chopping off the heads of everyone that disagreed with him him. Oh, and there was Queen Pixie. Oh, she loved the stories about the trolls and the fairy friends that Pixie had. And Daisy continued in awe, walking along the hallway. She then went up a long staircase and found herself outside an enormous wooden door with the Queen's room written in gold upon it. She took a gulp and was just about to knock upon the regal looking door when it swung open and the queen herself stood there in a diamond encrusted crown and a long red velvet cloak how lovely to meet you young lady the queen said to her with a wide smile upon her face oh do step inside daisy i've heard so much about you and join me for squash and cake the little girl had never seen a feast like it. There was cream cake, fruit cake, chocolate cake, rainbow cake, carrot cake, jam donuts, jam tarts, jam roly-poly, battenberg, scones and many more piled magnificently high on the green marble table. The little girl and the queen sat down together and devoured the fabulous feast and drank squash until both of them were fit to burst. After they had eaten, the Queen explained to the little girl why she needed her help. You see, Daisy, the Queen began, there is this big bad wolf called Mr Coriona and everyone is scared of him. He has become such a nuisance in my kingdom and I need someone very special to help me keep my people safe. Oh, yes, I know all about this, the little girl offered. I've not been able to go to school and it's been a very difficult time. I miss everyone so much and sometimes I get very sad. But I know the importance of staying home because your Prime Minister tells us to. Well, my researchers have told me that this ferocious wolf will disappear, but that it could take a little while and this is why I need your help. Your Majesty, I will help you in any way I can, whispered the child. Oh, I know you will. After all, we already both share a common bond in that wonderful film. Oh, the Little Mermaid, interrupted Daisy. My absolute fave of all time. The Queen laughed. <laughs> yes, Daisy, the Little Mermaid. But what can I do? I'm such a small child. Oh, there is so much you can do. I mean, take a look at this. The Queen passed to Daisy. The Daily Hearsay. It was the King, Kingdom's most popular newspaper. And there she was, on the front cover, waving from the imperial carriage. The headline read, by royal invitation. And the story was all about her. She was amazed at what people were saying about her, how very special she was and how important she'd become to the whole nation. Suddenly it dawned on her that for once in her life, people were actually taking notice of her. But what exactly do you want me to do, Your Majesty? The Queen replied simply, you must encourage people to stay indoors, to go out only if they need to, and to make sure they continue to wash their hands. Well, that should be easy. Now people are taking notice of me, Daisy replied. I will make sure that you have your own YouTube channel and that you have a prime slot on TV and your own radio station. And Daisy, I never want you to forget, you are important. And from that day, Daisy did exactly as the Queen had asked. And she realised that everyone was important and that no one should ever be forgotten. And after a while, she did go back to school and she did see her friends and she did play in the park. But that's another story. So I think what we need to remember is everyone's important from grown-ups to children. Hope you've enjoyed the story. As I say, I've written it, but you might recognise um, a little bit of the story from fairy tales you might have heard before. Please feel free to pass on. Thanks for listening. Bye.